There we go. All right. Um, well, I'd like to remind you that uh, we can continue all the networking great connections that we've made here tonight over at Heartland uh, in about an hour's time right across the street. So I highly recommend that. Um, and we are going to do our best to try and keep uh, on or very close to schedule. So um, therefore, we're going to get started with this panel right now. Um, so I'm Graham Waller, and I am the founder of Ultralight Startups. I'm the organizer here in New York. And we're here today to talk about financing lean startups. So I hope uh, that is what all of you are here to hear about. Um, we've got a, a slightly enhanced format tonight. So that is, uh, that's great for all of you. You're, you're very lucky. Um, not only do we have our traditional four highly esteemed panelists, we also have two uh, opening remarks. Uh, and I was just mentioning to Kareem how, how thrilled I am to have uh, that addition to the agenda because I think both Kareem and Finn have done awesome jobs and are very opinionated and are, are very insightful about this topic. So um, we're going to hear from them uh, momentarily. First, I'm going to uh, read the bios here. So first we have Marat Oktahanoglu. Uh, Marat uh, most recently started and sold Central Inc., a location-based social network. Prior to founding Central, Marat was a technology consultant for 16 years, building web, media, and 3D infrastructures for SGI, Sony, Logitech, Pioneer, Panasonic, and various startups, including his own startup, thenextweb.com. Marat is also the, found, the organizer of Entrepreneur's Roundtable. And if you haven't been to Entrepreneur's Roundtable, you should definitely go. We are a competing organization with people like startups. <laughs> so. Vicious competition, Marat. Marat's event happens to be free also. So uh, that's an incentive to go over there. No pizza. <laughs> no pizza. Um, and uh, he, this is the second time Arad has been here. Last time was as a moderator. Um, so uh, he runs the Entrepreneur, uh, Entrepreneur's Roundtable. And his book on location-based services is coming out uh, this summer from Manning. So we will all look forward to buying your book, Marat. Uh, so I'm going to go then to Peter, who's next in line. Peter Rothberg is a partner with Dwayne Morris, LLP, a full-service law firm. He focuses on corporate securities, venture capital, mergers and acquisitions, financial transactions, and digital media company representation. Peter represents both startups and venture capital funds, including Village Ventures, High Peaks Ventures, Borealis Ventures, Stonehenge Capital, in financing and acquisition transactions. So both funds and many startups as well uh, through all stages of, of, uh, of, of activity and funding. Uh, additionally, Peter sits on the board of the New York Tri-State Chapter of the Koretsu Forum and is the lawyer in residence for the NYU Stern School of Business Entrepreneurship Program and, if that's not enough, is legal counsel. Probably his, his most proud acclaim is to be legal counsel to ultralight startups. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, Peter, for joining us. Uh, Joe Chin, also probably has attended as, nearly as many ultralights as I have. Um, he is uh, the founder and CEO of SourcePad, which we heard about earlier, an instant outsourcing company. Prior to SourcePad, Joe was the founding CEO of Guidester, now Search and Dice Commerce, an e-commerce ad network. Joe was also the managing director of REOL, internet analyst at Laidlaw, founder president at Diadem, a multiplayer game company, and founder principal of JEV, an import-export company. So I think he put the cereal in, in cereal entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, Joe is a frequent speaker and has been quoted in numerous publications such as Business Week, Fortune, Inc. Magazine over the course of his career. Joe has raised over $20 million in financing for both angels and VCs. Uh, and at the end of the panel, we have Brad Burnham. Uh, Brad is a partner at Union Square Ventures, an early stage venture capital fund focused on web services. Prior to Union Square, Brad held a variety of sales and marketing and business development positions at AT&T and Bell Laboratories, and was a founder at AT&T Ventures for spin-out Echologic. After Echologic was sold, Brad joined AT&T Ventures as an executive in residence and later general partner, where he was responsible for 14 investments. Brad currently serves on the boards of Indeed, Pinch Media, Tumblr, Wasabi, Adaptive Blue, Simul Media, Tracked.com, Meetup, and Bug Labs, amongst others. So uh, who could ask for a better panel, really, to talk about uh, lean startups? So as I said, we're going to hear from 
from these guys uh, very shortly. We're going to start by hearing from Kareem, who is the founder of the New York Lean Startup Meetup, who has prepared about a five-minute talk. And then we're going to hear from Finn Barnes uh, on his uh, take on Lean Startup. So why don't you come up then, Kareem? Thank you, Graham. Um, very excited to talk to this group. I've been following um, ultralight startups for a while. Um, so my love affair with Lean Startup, how did it start? Um, doing things wrong leads to learning how to do things right. My first startup, I did a lot wrong. And, you know, it took, and the main thing that I found was I was spending a lot of time building very, very awesome features that nobody wanted to use. They were amazing, but nobody used them. And I, after sort of doing this for about a year, I realized that there has to be a better way. And I was really searching and reading, and I had come across Mark Anderson's blog, um, and he had written a lot about product market fit, and you know, it started to make sense. And then Fraser Kelton, who works at Adaptive Blue, um, had sent out this uh, post on Next and Wine. He was like, um, he had found Startup Lessons Learned, which is Eric Reese's blog, and he had sent it out, and he was like, this is amazing material. And you know, I think I read every single post that night. Um, you know, pinged, ping, pinged Fraser on Twitter, had breakfast with him, and founded the Lean Startup Meetup with Fraser um, about a year, I think a year and two months ago now. So what is Lean Startup? Um, I think this chart sort of boils it down. It's basically success equals iterating quickly. Um, it, it, you know, every single startup starts off as an idea. And you know, in your head, that is the best thing that will ever happen to the world around you. And you're sure it's going to be as big as Google. And you build it. And then after that, you realize that what you've built um, isn't necessarily what, or not, people aren't as excited about it as you had imagined. Um, and this is where this cycle sort of starts. And the idea is that you take your idea, you build it, you then measure that response from what you've built, um, and you take that learning, and those learnings then go into sort of figuring out new ideas to put back into this cycle. Um, and a lot of the Lean Startup, you know, the toolkit, as I like to call it, is about iterating through this loop as quickly as possible and learning as much as possible through every single iteration. Um, and I'd like to caveat, and I'm sure Finn's going to talk a lot more about this afterwards, is that you know, everything you do in terms of listening to your customers and, and sort of trying to get this feedback um, is, is never really going to supplant um, um, your sort of um, ingenuity in figuring out the right solution. Um, so people will tell you what problems they're having, but it's up to you as the entrepreneur to figure out the right solution. OK. Well, I'm going really slow. OK. So um, I won't get into this. It basically started with Steve Blank and um, Four Steps of Epiphany. I recommend everybody read it. It's, it's not a great read in terms of how it's written, but there's a lot of really great information in that book. Um, and then Eric Reese sort of took that, and, and he, you know, Eric, uh, Steve Blank really talked about how to do things for enterprise, say, um, enterprise software startups, and Eric Reese took that for Web 2.0. Um, so toolkit, I'm just going to rush through these. Um, one is product market fit. How do you figure out whether your product is meeting the market need? And, and Mark Anderson blogged about this a lot, and Sean Ellis has a very simple sort of question that you can ask. Um, to figure out whether you have pro product market fit. Um, MVP, what is the most minimal thing that you can build to learn the most? Um, and there's a lot of you know, interesting ways to do things from just getting up a landing page in, in a day and sending people to it and starting to gather feedback. Um, agile development, that allows you to build quickly. Um, continuous deployment, that allows you to deploy what you've built extremely quickly. Um, you know, This is uh, Dave McClure's um, startup metrics for pirates, the R 
uh, methodology. But you know, you, you know, everyone's used Google Analytics. There's like a million data points. This sort of boils it down into the five most important data points that you can make, you know, decisions on improving your business. Um, I really like this one, most minimum desirable product. And it's about building something that people love. And the great thing is it's usually more features does not equal more desirability. So it's about finding that one feature that everybody loves. I think Foursquare is a really good example of that. Um, continuous usability testing, that's about really understanding and getting feedback from your customers on a continual basis, not just doing, doing it once as part of your, your, your life cycle. Um, and then finally, you know, Lean Startup doesn't guarantee success. It's not a checklist. It's different for everyone. Um, but this is, you know, it is about standing on the shoulders of giants. And there's some amazing sort of people who have um, contributed um, to, to this sort of movement. And um, I, I recommend everyone check it out. Thank you. So, you want to take your laptop, Kareem? Just a sec while we switch this. Get thin slides up here. I should have been queued up before I got on stage. <laughs> but here we are. Cool. Hi, so I'm uh, Finn Barnes. I'm the principal at First Round Capital. Uh, and I've been... Speaking been, the mic. Sorry. Very close to okay. Is that a little better? I've, I've uh, been, ever since sort of joining First Round, even before that, uh, as an entrepreneur, you know, sort of been a fan of the iterate and learn model. And then as it became sort of called lean startups, uh, kind of watched at First Round, we get to see a lot of patterns we look at. You know, 3,000 deals a year, and personally, I see hundreds, and, and you start to recognize patterns coming in in the door. And one of them was definitely this, this sort of lean pattern, and people really being able to do amazing things with just a little bit of capital and, and really build some things. Um, but I also uh, started to see started to see some another pattern, which was which was troubling. Right. So you sort of have lean done right is fantastic, and a lot of people talk about that, and, and Kareem's meetup group, and this group, and you know, you, you sort of get people getting together to talk about how to do it right. And I think that sometimes, you know, my fear is that in this process of iterating and the process of sort of, you know, creating something and putting it out in the market, listening to your consumer and, and learning, you can end up uh, just spinning your wheels. You can end up sort of chasing your tail and not actually moving something forward. And the challenge is that as you're doing this, you feel like you're pursuing the lean startup methodology. So of course, eventually, you're gonna achieve this product market fit. And eventually, you're gonna develop your customers and you're gonna hit an MVP that, that takes off. Um, but the, the, the challenge, I think, is to make sure that as you do that, um, you stay in alignment with your, with your vision, right? Your ultimate, your, your first vision. And, because that's, that's really what you do as, as an entrepreneur, right? You, the market will tell you what it, what it thinks it wants today. And a lot of times it's wrong. And, and your job is to, to basically say, what will it need you know, tomorrow or, or the day after that. And, and so I think the challenge is when, when you're hungry, you know, everything starts to look like a great meal. And so as you're going through this process and, and you're having trouble getting traction, you get these little signals, you know, and you start to chase them and you, you go down these alleys and, and ultimately you're racing against the clock and you're spending resources and time as, as you're doing this. Um, when I worked at AM1, we saw this with, uh, we were doing great with t-shirts and shorts. And we had a nice, you know, $20 million revenue business in, in apparel. And we were trying to decide, should we pursue a new product line? And what should that be? And the obvious thing that looking at the industry was we should do footwear. But every consumer we talked to said, no, you guys are crazy. You can't do footwear. It's, you know, I want to buy Nike. I want to buy Adidas. You guys should do an energy drink. So we did footwear. And we built a $200 million business in footwear. And we never would have been successful at, at energy drinks. Um, I did a fitness video game. And uh, you know, 
it was relatively successful. We sold a couple hundred thousand copies. It was PS2, Xbox. Um, and when we first took that minimum viable product out, it was just a video demo. And everyone we showed it to was someone who participated in home fitness. And they were like, cool, just make an interactive DVD. And they're like, no, you know, we really want to do game console because we have all these other ideas that you don't necessarily understand. And they said, well, we don't really use the game console. But we did it anyway. And now fitness gaming is a, is a big thing. And, and people are using the game console for, for, uh, you know, for fitness. So I think you just want to make sure that you, you stay with your, with your vision. Um, and I think part of, part of the challenge as you think about you know, the equations behind the, the lean startup, you know, there's this outcome ownership probability <laughs> uh, thing. And what I, what I worry about there is ownership is the one thing that you have the closest control over. right? So your outcome is, is unknown. Your, the probability of that success is unknown. Ownership is something you sort of look at day to day and can kind of think, you know, well, if I take this much money at, at this valuation or, you know, that, what does that look like? And, you know, maybe I can just prove a little bit more and I can, I can raise a little bit more. Um, and so I think you can, you can sort of lose sight of the outcome, which is really a representation of your vision, right, in, in an effort to sort of be, be lean and, and continue to prove. Um, and so the, uh, the, the, the equation that I like, and I actually had a, a little edit to this, which, which I got in late, is... Um, Ownership actually is a function of the story times the data, um, and that's that's actually what generates the the financial return. And so, when you think about a lean startup, you know the, the iterations I think are all about here's here's my story, this is my vision, this is what I want to create, and now what what data do I need to validate that, or to disprove it, or to edit it, right, to modify it, and let me let me figure out how to generate that data, and then look at that and go back to my same story, see what the data tells me about that story. And sometimes choose to ignore my consumers and, and keep going, right? Because I can say they don't get it. And obviously, if you do that for a long time, you're, you're probably not listening. But there are times when, when you shouldn't listen and you, know, you should focus on your story. And there are other times when you really should listen, you should focus on your data. And I think the, the, the key thing that sometimes gets lost in talking about the lean startup is like that is what makes a great entrepreneur, is the ability to sort of look at story and data, have a great story, build the data that supports that story and, you know, never allow the opposite to occur, which is, you know, you sort of say, like, there's nothing like bad data to screw up a great story, right? So you don't want to go, you don't want that to happen. But um, so I think that's, that's sort of the one thing, caveat sort of I would have to the lean startup. Just make sure that you don't, you don't lose your vision, you know, be, be the missionary mindset and, and pursue that and have it be informed by your consumers, but don't allow it to be sort of defined uh, by your consumers. So that's what I got. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Okay. So, my So, um, what, maybe I'll start with a, a poll of the audience. What's people's familiarity level with the term lean as, as a way to describe startups? Can people raise your hand if you're familiar with that as a concept? Okay, so I guess that's nearly everybody. Well done. Um, how, so here's a question for the panel. What is, uh, how is lean different from agile or from bootstrapping? Or is this, a, you know, is this a new thing? Or is this something that's been around forever? I don't know. Marat, you look like you have an answer for that. Sure, I'm the first one here, so. <laughs> so I think like um, <clears throat> I, was, I was talking to Brad before this, and I look at all this as just guidelines. You know, there is no dogma, there is no rules, and lean is actually invented by Eric Ries because he took uh, Stephen Blank's class about customer development, and everybody here should definitely read Four Steps to the Epiphany. That's a must. You have to read that book. It's not a book actually; it's like a bunch of notes. And then uh, Eric Ries combines agile software development with customer development. And he kind of like uh, showed people how to combine engineering with the customer development process. And Lean started that way. So agile in this context uh, mostly refers to like Scrum or XP, like software development. And bootstrapping, as we all know, is, is, not, is trying to um, get as far ahead as possible using just limited resources without any funding. So there are different terms, but I think lean in general, uh, they tried different terms like agile startup and 
They also tried one more term, nothing worked. Uh, lean best represents how to take, how to apply customer development and combine with uh, agile software development. And there are some tools and methods and well-defined um, <laughs> guidelines for doing that. And when you read the book and when you look at on the web to Eric Reese's blog, you see great examples and it's very inspiring actually, so. So it's a new thing. Ultimately what you're saying is lean is a new thing. Um, Brad, is it important to you that the, the companies that you fund are lean or is that, is that, is that a buzzword? Um, you know, I, I have actually not read the book, so I'm not sure I, I, I know exactly what the, the definition is from the book. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's there, there are a bunch of characteristics that we've talked about here that are very important and uh, that we care a lot about. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of reasons why um, you'd rather stay, uh, rather take in less money, uh, get further along, uh, before you begin to uh, put the infrastructure in place that starts the sclerosis that happens to every company that gets larger and larger. Um, and so uh, it is really important to us. Things that we, w we won't fund and we will run away from are uh, businesses that have had um, a large amount of money put in them, $10 million invested, say, and they, uh, prior to launch, uh, they built big teams, uh, they built organizations, Everybody in those organizations had responsibilities, and they didn't have a clear business or a business model, and they then tried to pivot. And if you try and pivot where it's two guys who have known each other for 10 years, maybe trying to make something happen, that's, that's a fairly easy pivot. But if you've got an organization of 200 people with 10 department heads, each of whom have their own little empire, and you want to pivot, that's virtually impossible. So um, it is, I think, a you know, it is a much better way to start a business. And I, I'll, yeah, I don't want to talk any longer than that, but I, we, we can talk a lot about that. Okay, um, so we talked about pivots, and this is something that if you have read any of the uh, lean literature or lean uh, blogs, you will hear again and again. Um, I am not, I, okay, what is, Joe, do you know what a pivot is? Can you explain that and, and how that's different from, you know, business that existed before lean? Um, sure. I'm not hearing that. Um, yeah, uh, in my mind, you know, pivots really describe when someone needs to uh, change significantly in terms of what their business is. Um, and you know, I was talking to Graham uh, maybe a few days uh, or a week or so uh, before this. I don't know if that's really new because you know we used to call that changing our business model you know, before Lean came along. So I don't think Lean can, Lean can actually claim that theory, but is sort of a crux with uh, the whole agile and lean startup movement. Meaning you have to be very, um, very flexible, and you have to almost have that built into your culture. I think as a startup, to uh, to really uh, affect the lean methodology. So certainly, it's very important. And something that I've noticed, uh, at least when when listening to to Eric Reese, was about these the, sort of like the quantity of pivots, like. You, like it's like a certain like you equate that with the runway of a startup like I have five pivots left before I run out of funding and you know if I plan right I'm gonna pivot the right five times and then and then I'll be a success at the end and if you just focus on the quantity of pivots you know is, is there is that a is that a guarantee of success or are you saying like oh you know I'll just have some more add some more pivots to the end and and that'll be uh, then then that'll be successful I don't know Take it. Go ahead, Marat. Actually, <clears throat> one thing that I read what, which was really helpful for me for understanding this idea was with pivots, you don't actually jump. So you actually lift one, one leg and you put it in, a, in another place, but your other foot is still in the old place. So you're not like, you're not becoming like a, you know, a parallel company from like a, you know, a web uh, fitness company, but you're actually, Actually, there are like three pivots, if we can go a little further. One of them is the segment pivot, which is you're actually uh, taking like an existing product and you're trying to repurpose it for another customer segment. And the other one is uh, you're still like targeting the same customer segment, but you're trying to solve a different problem in the same customer segment. And the third one, which is the most common, is the feature pivot, which is you have lots of features. Let's say the, the travel, uh, the Russian, 
the travel sorts that are you. Uh, you look at your customers and you realize they are using this one feature, which is like maybe like instant messaging between uh, people. So you, you do the feature pivot and you make your company an uh, IM company about travel, like in real time. So I think it's important like not to jump because it's as Stephen Blank recommends, when you are doing customer development, you are not asking people what to develop. You're just testing your own thesis. Like you have to have your own idea about what you're building. You're not asking people, what should I build? But you're asking them, like, should I build this? Would you buy? So I think it's really important not to like jump around too much. Okay. So number of pivots, uh, I think it's irrelevant. <laughs> I could offer an example of a pivot that I think worked out really well. We're investors in a company called Tengen, which makes a database called MongoDB. Uh, it's used by a lot of uh, highly scalable web services. And uh, they start off life as a cloud platform that provided basically, you know, sort of an Amazon Web Services in a box for anybody who wanted to build a website. And um, they, it, in order to do that, they had to create a database. Uh, but then what happened in listening to their customers is everybody said, can I get the database separately? And after the 30th time they'd heard that, they said, well, wait a minute, nobody wants this whole package that we're offering, but everybody seems to want our database. And so what are we doing here? And they just started offering the database, and now they've shed everything but the database. But it's an example of that. They didn't, they didn't go into apparel. You know, they, uh, they pivoted. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got an, an example of that with one of my, my clients that, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over a bad cold, that started out developing a gaming, a mobile gaming product that was going head to head with Foursquare. We all know where that ended up. So they had to pivot by uh, taking what they had been doing, building this platform, a location-based platform for gaming, and they began, because they, they, they weren't going to beat out Foursquare, that they had to use it for other purposes. And they're now building, they're, they're building applications using their platform for consumer products that want to reach their customers in a, in a different way that their platform serves. But they didn't keep banging their head against the wall trying to be Foursquare. They realized that they had to pivot, they had to change, they listened to their customers uh, and realized that they had to make a change. That seems to me a lot of what I've, what I have read about Lean and what I've heard to today is just what I always called good business. I mean, you don't just keep banging your head against the wall if you're not getting traction. You realize that, that you, you listen to your customers where you try to find out what your customers want and you try to then use what you have uh, in a way that's going to be able to benefit customers or that uh, you can find some traction in the marketplace from. So it just seems that it's a revisiting of good business practice to to, to practice lean as, 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 I've been, as I've been hearing it tonight. Sounds good. I, I, so I asked everyone to come up with their, their favorite uh, lean success story. It sounds like Brad and Peter have given theirs. Uh, Joe, do you want to, do you have a, a favorite lean success other than your own, of course? Oh, of course not my own. Um, sure, I'd, I'd actually like to uh, just point out one of our client companies, Twigmore, who you may have spoke, uh, heard spoke earlier. Um, it's kind of interesting because they actually started out as an avatar-based e-learning company for the web. And if you saw their pitch earlier, they recently pivoted to change it to sort of a social game for thought leaders on Facebook. So, I mean, that really is almost like, I don't want to describe it as like a 180 degree pivot, you know, keeping one foot down and totally rotating. And, but because of that change, I mean, they've done a great job at just rebuilding themselves. And um, the success part of it is that they just did close on their first round of funding. Um, so they did that fairly quickly in a short period of time. So I think it's a very relevant, recent example. And of course, they're an ultralight company, so. Awesome, great example, Joe, thank you. Marat, do you have I'll, a? I'll give a non-ultralight company example. Okay. Is it okay? If you must. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think PayPal is the most famous uh, pivot example. PayPal started as a PDA, cryptography uh, transmission application. So you ran it on your Palm Pilot, and you direct it to the other person, and there was like high, very uh, high-grade security, it, the payment went to the other PDA, but then they realized like everybody was using their email method instead of the, the highly developed and great cryptographic uh, transfer method. So they kind of like dumped that and they started the email method, which became PayPal. So, so you have to watch your customers, what they're doing. Definitely. So it seems like there's, there's a similarity between Brad's story and, and PayPal in that, you know, 
it's, I had a product and customers were using it for something else and all of a sudden I just said, all right, well, now that's what we're doing. We're just going to listen to what, what, we're, what our customers are already, you know, you know sort of this paving the cow paths uh, sort of a, of, of a metaphor. I'm, I'm following the, the traffic that's already existing, whereas, you know, there's also pivots. It seems to be that that distinction is not made. People can just say, oh, well, this is not working. I'm going to try that, that nobody ever actually wanted what I'm going to be pivoting to, or that, that in itself is a hypothesis. Right. You, pivots are usually like, you know, they, they are, uh, the customers tell you, but the biggest, and as uh, Finn said, uh, it takes a great entrepreneur to, to know when to pivot or where to pivot. So it's really important. And also there's the problem of the local maxima, which was, which became popular recently. Uh, when you're analyzing and when you're looking customer, when you're looking at customer data, you can only uh, optimize in that where you're looking. So as a good entrepreneur, you have to look at the big picture so you are seeing lots of data, but you know knowledge. You have to. It's difficult to extract uh, wisdom and knowledge from that data. So it's really, really critical to know when to pivot. Is is is, is lean uh, a stage of that every startup goes through, or is it a type of startup that you're either lean or you're not? And or you know, another way to phrase it: after you're funded, are you still lean? You know, could you be lean if you have a headcount of a thousand people? I would think you have to try to continue to be lean because I, I think it's as good business practice to listen and not fall in love with you. I mean, I, I, I think there's, and maybe that's what I think what, what Finn was saying in, in his presentation, which is, yes, some, you know, sometimes you have to believe in what you're doing and not listen to your customers. I, but I would think that that is more the, I don't think you can build a rule around that. I think that's more the exception than the rule. You could go down with the ship saying that your, you know, that, that your life raft that didn't work was really the best one. If only it had been, if only it had fallen off the ship in a different angle. Um, I think at, there are times when you really, do, when you have to adjust, you have to pivot, and it doesn't matter whether you're. I mean, look, look at what IBM did. I mean, I, IBM made mainframes, and they realized this is not the right business for us any any longer. They sold that entire business and became a services business. So I'm a little troubled that we're defining lean as flexible, um, because I'm not sure that's the only way to define it. Uh, another company I would I would argue is is a lean startup is Craigslist, um, and they haven't changed a bit um, ever. Uh, probably a lot of us would argue they could change, uh, <laughs> but um, they you know they're in 450 markets in 55 countries. They're the seventh largest site in the English language. They have 31 employees. That's lean. So lean to you is more about you know effective use of resources than it is about changing and pivoting. I think so. I think also th that there th part of the reason that this terminology has become so much in vogue right now is that I think it's it's not possible to do a lean startup in semiconductors. You know you could argue that okay we're fabulous you know we're design oriented we're, you know, so that's leaner than Intel but it's not really a lean startup. You have to make a significant investment and you have to make a bet that isn't flexible at all But when you make the chip. It's probably also true of biotechnology. It's very difficult to do a, a lean startup that, re inquire, that requires a lot of re research and a lot of development before you go to market. Uh, the thing about the web is that you can put something out there very, very inexpensively and you can iterate much less expensively and so I think this is not a phenomenon that we would have been talking about 15 years ago. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with. <laughs> I think I'd agree with Brad that certainly certain industries do not lend itself to the lean theory, but I, I actually believe that the lean theory is should is and should be decoupled from capital. You know, I think you can be lean and have to raise a good amount of capital. Lean is more about getting yourself to the product market fit and really um, figuring out whether your venture is feasible and doing it in a certain way which would get you there faster. Okay, so just for fun, what's an example? Of, uh, of, an, of an industry that, or a startup that requires a lot of capital and yet is lean. Well, I think that even in, in the industries that you, you talked about, there are probably different ways of, of putting your product out there and iterating. Probably the cycles are longer and probably the capital investment is much higher than what we're talking about in this room. But I'm, I'm guessing there are different variations within that. But even within the internet sector, there are certain industries here among people in this crowd 
where the capital requirements are different. And how they run their startups and how they get to that product market fit is more of a management um, type of style and more of how they build their company and how they get there. It's not necessarily tied to capital. I think maybe biomedical might be a good example. You need lots of money for research, but you can be lean doing that. You can iterate quickly, but still it takes years and you need lots of capital maybe. So, sorry, which, which just, just for case, I, I would, I just, I, I don't really see that. I think you know, when you say you can iterate quickly, if you, if you, if you, if it requires two years of R&D and 25 people, um, you know, sort of three or four million dollars of capital before you put your first product in front of a customer, um, how do you iterate quickly? But as you know, what they're doing is mostly they put together um, <laughs> chemicals and they try them. So maybe they can optimize that process or maybe genome research. It requires lots of money, but it can be lean. I mean, like I said, I, I would still say that there are certain industries, I think you are being very industry specific, where you know lean is probably not going to be uh, the right description, no matter what you do. But I, I'm just saying that in general, especially for, for this crowd, and most people here are internet entrepreneurs, you know, we could, I, would, I would think it would make sense to sort of decouple uh, the amount of capital that you raise from lean. You know, and, that, and I think that's a little bit of a difference in, in the definition of lean. I mean, lean used to mean that you're running the company on very little capital or substantially less capital than maybe your traditional model. But I think the lean startup movement is more about a methodology and a way in which you run the company, um, like I said, with those goals in mind, like getting product market fit and figuring out whether your company is viable. So yeah, pr product market true. fit is another buzz or a buzz phrase, I suppose, that often is, is heard in this, in this context. Um, I would like to know, what is product market fit? What does it have to do with being lean? What does it have to do with investment? Uh, Mariah, you got, actually, a, yeah, you got an answer to that. Again, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really simple. Uh, product market fit is so simple. You give your product to users. They use it for a while. And you go back to them and you say, OK, now I'm taking this away. And then you look at what they are saying. If they are saying they're very disappointed, and if 40% of people are saying they're, they're very disappointed, then you have product market fit. And this, has, this comes from Sean Ellis, and he's tried this apparently on like 100 startups. So he's tried this like 100 times with different startups. And um, he's seen that when 40% of the people are very, very unhappy, when you take the product away, that company catches on and they like kind of take off. And when that uh, percentage is less than 40%, uh, the company just dies off. Um, so, so, so I clearly, I guess, once you've got that, there's no need to pivot anymore, and you're no longer lean, right? No, this was again <laughs> like a very popular discussion between uh, Fred Wilson, Brad's partner, and Ben Horowitz, and and also Mark Anderson says, you know, there's a before product market fit and there's an after product market fit, and some people are saying you're always like doing the PMF. I mean, um, there's something probably that should be said about the particular market that uh, a lot of us in the room are involved in. Um, and it relates to this bullet point, sustaining a system with lots of users and no revenue model. We're sort of famous for investing in companies with lots of users and no revenue models. Um, and um, so the question is, what defines product market fit? Uh, y y you know, Twitter has 61 million users. Uh, Foursquare has, you know, m several million users and is growing very, very qu quickly. You can argue that they have found a product market fit that 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 both of them have. I think you could argue Facebook, the sixth largest country in the world, has found product market fit, and yet they don't have customers yet. None of them, right? So there's a there's two sides to this product market fit question. There's a you know, there's a side about how do you engage users and create value for consumers for end users in a platform like one of those three. And then there's a question about how do you ultimately create value for somebody else that sustains your investment and returns the investment in that platform. And that's an entirely separate question. And that's the experiment that's going on right now. So there's a whole second layer of product market fit that has to do with monetization that um, is, you know, just starting to take place in some of these platforms. So it's worth investing in a, in a company that has lots of users, even if it hasn't found the revenue model, just because they've, they've fit something. They've, they've tapped into uh, a need, whether 
they monetize it or not. Is that it? So we, we believe that, and it's pretty obvious if you look at the portfolio that we believe that. And then, you know, but you could also make the argument that we haven't proven that yet, um, because this, this is still early innings in this particular game. Um, I, I think it's um, any time that you can engage the attention of very large numbers of users in a sustained way, uh, you have created something that is of value. And the tricky part in that model is um, being seduced. It's so easy to say, okay, we're going to slap ads on it. We're going we're gonna to import a revenue model from a prior um, a prior regime, you know, back when media was one way and people used to watch advertisements. We're just going to slap those ads on this medium, but the medium advertising makes no sense in this medium. And so, the thing that we've encouraged our startups to do is um, is to really, in, in a way, this is another form of listening. Um, really listen to the network that you've built and try and find a, a revenue model that's native to that network that um, that actually has never existed before and couldn't exist outside the context of that network. And if you can do that, and if you look at sponsored tweets, you know, that, that's, that's kind of there. You couldn't have imagined sponsored tweets without Twitter. Um, and so uh, and I think it's also true of paid search. You can't imagine paid search outside of the context of search. And so we, th there are native revenue models that will ultimately emerge if you're patient and you listen to the network and you look for ways to create value for some third party usually. It's kind of a media model. Um, but you do it in a way that doesn't diminish any value at all for the other users of the network who've created all the value in the first place. And, and, and at the same time, <clears throat> you're being lean possibly by, in, in the pivoting sense, by trying one revenue model, it doesn't work, adjust it, try something else, keep on your, your your, your investment model is that you see something that has many, many users and, and you, you recognize that there's value there somehow and you're willing to take the time to try different ways to monetize that, that interest, that consumer interest, right? Yes. Sure. Hey, I just wanted to address that issue just in terms of how do you know when you've found product market fit? Um, and I, you know, I always go back to in all of my companies, it's almost like part of the vision in a way. And really, you, you, know, you have a vision for the company, you kind of know what you want to provide. When you found product market fit, I think you almost have a vision as to how this is either going to make a lot of money, and you, actually, you kind of know how you're going to deliver the product, what the margins are going to look like. But there's always that sense of vir viralness or growth, one of the two. So I think if you have something like that, and it's, sometimes it's more quantitative than others, but I think that's what you're looking for, when you've found that and you can feel all those things. And then you, you, know, you almost naturally start to turn, uh, your thoughts start to turn towards scaling. And uh, going back to, to your original question, I actually think at that point, once you've hit that point, your company does change. And you may actually go beyond being the lean startup because you found that product market fit. And you might start thinking of other things. And the people that you employ to take your company forward at that point also changes in my opinion. Um, and I'm not saying you abandon the lean startup approach, but at that point that the lean startup approach might actually now go to the biz dev department. And, and now you're just focused on getting people who are gonna make their numbers, collect their bonus, kill it next month, even bigger, and start to go. It's a different thing, answer that point. So, that, that, that's, that's so, point. so how, how does investment relate to um, Finding a product market fit is it is it you want to have a system that is people are very passionate about and you've got user growth, you know, putting aside whether you have revenue, uh, is that is that the point that you say okay now I'm going to seek funding? Is it ever appropriate to seek funding before that point or not to have funding after that point? You know, for any any of the reasons listed here, say you know say you know is it is it appropriate to, to have funding for a company that hasn't found that that's just developing an application, developing a prototype? You know, many many of the startups here you know, are, are building their first system or they're trying to understand what their product is and what the, who their market is, is that, is that a fundable um, prospect? Marat? Um, you should ask Brad. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you have such great answers. Brett, what do you think, Brad? Well, um, I, I, you know, first of all, we only invest in one thing, which is our essentially consumer-facing web services. And so 
um, I have a very limited view of this. And I would start off by saying that if you're going to do um, a medical device, you probably are going to raise money for proving a concept, finding an application, uh, finding the initial prototype, and finding the product market fit. Um, uh, but if you're going to do a web service, uh, I would argue that you should not be raising money other than you know, sort of friends and family angel uh, money until you get to the point that you're sustaining a system with lots of users um, but no revenue model. And I think that's a very fundable company. If you have uh, lots of users engaged and that's growing, um, there are a lot of people who, you know, and this wasn't true three years ago, by the way. I think we, there were three years ago it was hard to find somebody to fund a company like that. But I think today there are a lot of people that have watched Facebook, watched Twitter, and said, oh, you know, there's value being created here. We'll fund that. Um, the next three, um, just again from our perspective, um, acceleration being first to market competition, the, you know, those are not, um, you know, if, if, if the reason you're asking for, you know, maybe significant venture dollars is because there's a big competitor in the space that you have to beat, that's not a great investment from a venture person's perspective. That means you're using our money to take a risk on whether or not you can get by this big gorilla. Um, and um, so those are, those are a little bit more questionable. The servers are melting is related to the sustaining a system one. If the servers are melting because you've got lots of users, that's really fundable. Okay. Um, what about for your own, so we had two entrepreneurs here, both of us uh, and successfully uh, venture funding. Um, what, what drove you to that point? What was, the, what was the, the, the point that you said, okay, now this is, this is something I'm going to seek funding for? All right. Uh, I mean, when I first started Central, like two and a half years ago, I, had, I didn't know this stuff. So I was just going common sense. And at some point, we had 120,000 uniques a month, and people were using it a lot. Uh, it was like a location-based social yeah. network. This was before all the mayorships and all the points and all the good stuff, badge, badges. And at that point, I believe that taking the money would enable me to uh, grow the system much larger. But uh, I think every entrepreneur knows, like, at some point, like, how you can grow your business. Like, everybody who pitched tonight here, I think everybody has an idea, like, um, how much money they would need to take their business to the next level. But uh, one thing, actually, if I may insert this, like, we are mentioning four steps to the epiphany in the book, and the four steps in the book, which Eric Ries took and uh, kind of merged with agile software development are customer discovery, customer validation, and then uh, customer creation, and then the, the company building, which is in the first step, you're actually, before you start developing, you go out there and you start talking to people, hey, I'm building this thing, would you use it? And then you build hypotheses, and I think we're, we're just focusing on the pivots and the PMF, but I think there's like a very, very uh, good common sense approach to building something. And if you follow those steps, when you get to product market fit, you already have a, a repeatable sales cycle and you have users, at least 40% of them will kill you if you take away the product. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, if you follow the steps and if you get there, uh, I think there are investors for every level of startup. Uh, now there are angels, there are now seeds there's seed start in New York City. Uh, there's super angels. There are uh, all there are VCs. There are early stage VCs. There are private equity firms. So uh, I think any company can be funded. So I don't know if Brad agrees with that, but um, Joe, Joe, you've got a, a bunch of companies. I, I believe uh, SourcePad is yes. not yet funded. So what was the uh, or, or maybe actually. I don't like the way I phrased that. Maybe it will never be funded. I mean, then that'll be a real victory for you because you'll own 100% of it. Oh, uh, so. yes. Well, actually, I will correct you because SourcePass does have some angel funding. Oh. So I don't know if you knew that. Uh -oh. but, uh, but I was going <laughs> to say, just speaking from you know all the different situations that I've taken funding, I think I've taken funding in every different situation. I'd almost break it down to like there, there are maybe three different cases that you want to think about. Um, and I think you, as entrepreneurs, you might want to approach them and think about them slightly differently. One is, and this is kind of funny because I almost feel like with the lean uh, startup movement, they've actually given us a new lexicon um, in terms of how to talk about startups, but perhaps even how to categorize where you are as a company. Because I think once you've hit product market fit, you know, your funding decision is, is 
well, it's pretty easy, meaning that it's a lot easier to raise money as per Brad's point. And also um, you're not gonna pay a heavy price for it. You're probably not gonna give up a lot of uh, equity. Uh, you'll get good terms, so on and so forth. So that's the ideal situation that you wanna be in to fund the company, particularly VC. However, before that, before you hit product fit, sometimes you do need money. And it's a personal thing. It varies from company to company, an entrepreneur to entrepreneur. You may need money to get yourself to the product market fit or to profitability. If you're so lucky, you can see that vision. And sometimes you have to raise money. And um, it's, it's a lot tougher there. And um, you know what I challenge people, I mean, I've done it there too, um, is yeah, well, you can either do it the friends and family way, which I think is probably the preferred way nowadays, simply because you know the recession has probably hit angel funding a lot harder than VC funding from, from what I can tell and from what I've heard. Um, but also I've seen, because you can build now products a lot cheaper, um, which is the other fundamental change that has gone on in the last like four or five years, people can do a lot more with friends and family type funding. But the other thing that I'd bring up is that in terms of that approach, I would really look very hard at um, just trying to make things stretch. And we've talked about bootstrapping here at Ultra. And um, you know, there's a lot of different things that you can do to besides you know, spending your development dollars well, you know, see where you can get from partners and so on and so forth. And you know, it's just smart, scrappy entrepreneurs, you can see that they can do that during that phase. And, and the other part of it, and this relates to lean, is if you are going to um, raise money during that time and you're assessing your needs, make sure that you put into your projections the, um, the iterations and, and the um, having to, to iterate with the market and with your customer. Don't just think that, because I think people are still thinking that I'm just, I just need X amount of money to build my product. But in a way, that might just be your minimum viable product and your first one. <laughs> you may actually need to iterate a few more times. So just make sure that you build that in there as well. So, Peter, you represent many companies that have successfully uh, been financed by all levels of angels and, and seed funding and investors and, and VCs. W w what do you find common amongst them? What, what, at what point should they, should they be seeking or are they, did they become successful seeking funding? Well, I, I think <clears throat> it really, that, that there is no one size that, that fits all. I, I think the, the companies that, that have been the most successful in seeking funding are those that have been able to demonstrate that there is, uh, that there's some acceptance of what they're, they're trying to do with their, with their company and that there's some, there's some runway towards, towards success. Um, it's very, in these, in these times, it's become in, increasingly difficult in, in, in my experience to, to find funding for just an idea. I mean, a few years ago, you could have a great idea and people would run all over the place to give you, to, to throw money at you. That doesn't happen anymore. Now there has to be much more of a demonstration that there is, that there's a, a, a strong pathway to success in order to obtain financing today. But there really is no one, you know, it's, it's very hard for, for me to, to overly generalize what, you know, who has gotten funding and who has, and who is flamed out trying. And if I may just say one thing, actually, um, again, uh, Brad's partner, Albert Wenger, said this and it kind of stayed with me. Uh, he said, some entrepreneurs actually see getting funding as a goal, like their goal is getting funding and they work very hard, they work hard and hard and they get funding and they think like they're done. <laughs> so actually I, getting- I, I have a phrase for that. <laughs> I, I like to call it the cult of funding. That, that, that you talk to so many people out there and it's like, you know, our, the first, as if the first job of an entrepreneur is to seek funding. And I think, you know, at some level, it's a, that's a failure. You're giving up part of your company, you're giving up control, you're giving up your vision. And, uh, you know, if you, can, if you can get to the same goal without, without getting funding, then you're that much better off. I agree. Actually, I think like if you, if you have a path to uh, growing and scaling your business and getting funding may be acceptable to defend Brett here, but uh, I think like getting funding and also if you look at the numbers, uh, very, very few of the startups get funding. So you have to look at the numbers. It's right. less than 1%. And the, yeah, the last time we covered bootstrapping here, there was a very heated discussion about some of the stats and the vast majority of funded startups fail. 
So it's by no means, you know, a guarantee of success that to get funded, therefore you, you become successful on your, you know, cruising around on your yacht somewhere. As most of them fail, even if, they, even if they are funded. I have a couple of sort of practical suggestions on, on uh, angel funding, seed funding, uh, and that is that, um, you know, I, I do think that, that those first couple of stages up to the point where you have this product market fit um, should be angel funded, seed funded, uh, funded by friends and family. Um, but there are different, different categories there. And the people that I think you'd really like to work with are, you'd like to ideally find an entrepreneur who's been successful in a similar space, uh, has a net set of connections and network and affinity for what you're doing um, to make that investment. And if you can find a way to reach that person and pitch that person, that person's gonna make a decision based on your conviction, your personality, the work that you've done, and their, their confidence in you, not in the idea and not in the proof points, because the proof points won't be there. And there are people out there who will make that investment, and um, you should look for them. Um, there are other people who are kind of day trippers into the angel funding world uh, that are real estate speculators that have a bunch of money or Wall Street bankers or whatever, and they, they throw money around. But if you look at their portfolio, and this is one thing you should do if you're talking to somebody about money, what, what else have you invested in? You know, they've got an apparel company and a fast food chain and a beverage company and an internet startup. And you go, okay, well, how much am I going to learn here? So I would, I would really try and find somebody who's got an affinity for what it is that you're trying to do. Second thing is I'd be a little bit cautious. A lot of venture firms have created uh, seed fund uh, programs, whether it's a, um, a convertible debt, uh, you know, they'll give you $250,000 to go start. And they, they lump those all into one sort of, one portfolio company. And it, it's not something that they pay a lot of attention to. And they're fairly liberal with those. So you can get that money fairly quickly. But you're not going to get a lot of attention. And you have one significant risk there. And that is that if that company, if that venture capital company decides not to do the Series A, then that sends a signal to the marketplace that they know something that everybody else doesn't know. Because gosh, you've been in their incubator now for a year and they're not funding you. So uh, it, it basically you know, shoots you in the head, not in the foot, in the head. And so um, it's something that, you know, that if, if you have a high degree of confidence, if you have a great relationship with that group, if, um, if you have a, lo a, a great dialogue and a great rapport, then that's a risk that's worth taking. But if it's, uh, if it's just you know, they're throwing it at you and you don't really have a relationship, I'd be very careful about that. Yeah, I was going to add to that point because I think I've had this discussion with several entrepreneurs who are doing fund fundraisers right now about that danger. I think it also uh, exists in some of the incubators too because some of the incubators are tied to VC funds. So you almost have that same shadow that falls over your company if for whatever reason it might have n nothing to do with you actually because they have whatever, 30 different companies in that incubator. <laughs> But uh, for whatever reason, they decide not to follow on or actually just even do their first investment with you. Then you have that, that shadow. Um, so, but there are other incubators that don't, by definition, follow on. So Y Combinator, Techstars, people like that. And so there, there's, I think, a lot less risk. Exactly. OK. Um, so Joe, you talked a bit about bootstrapping and uh, getting more for your money. Uh, Big part of bootstrapping, as far as I know, is getting getting some money in quickly, uh, and you know to the extent that you can, then that's proving a concept, that's proving to some extent a product market fit, and it's funding future development. So uh, there's a trade-off there between you know should you focus on getting revenue early, or should you focus on building a large number of users and then coming to Brad and saying, uh, look, we've got we've got we've got something to fund here. You know, I think I think it depends on your company. I mean, I'm not trying to uh, sound like a cop-out answer, but um, I know there are certain situations where, and it should probably work this way, where getting revenue is progressing your business anyway. You know, it's not a, sort of an either-or. Um, because, I mean, you want to, as I mentioned before, you kind of want to build to that product market fit where you have a vision as to how your company is going to multiply whether it's users or whether it's dollars um, or both. And I don't think it's, it's either one or the other usually. You know, if it's easy for you to get revenue in the door, that's probably something that is moving your business forward towards the product market fit. 
if it's not, then I don't know what kind of money you're actually getting. <laughs> usually, usually it's you're selling your product to a big company and you're getting them to pre-order or something like that, uh, which I've done in the past, you know, because they really want to market this. Um, just as an example, a concrete example, one of my companies in the past was a game company. So we actually got Panasonic uh, to pre-order a whole bunch of units. And, you know, they actually wanted to see us succeed, so they ended up writing the check first, which was great, because then you have a customer and you have money. So, you know, that's the type of thing that you could probably try, you know, if you really have some people who want to see you succeed. You know, and, and of course, they had to do it their own way, so make sure you play by their rules. You know, they, they wanted, they're like, oh, yeah, we really want you to succeed, but we can't invest in you, because back then they didn't have, you know, Panasonic Ventures, which they had now, but I don't think they have it anymore, just so everybody knows. It was there for a little while, for a little while. But back before that, they didn't have it at all, so they had to make it a purchase order, and, and that worked out fine. Um, uh, what about this, uh, this idea that the, Agile, the Lean startup is very data intensive and that you know, we're, we're testing hypotheses where we have this rigorous statistical approach, um, but gathering statistics and gathering data is expensive, and it's not something you can just say, okay, now, Give me all the data, who's using what, who's clicking on what uh, application, and, uh, oh my gosh, um, what um, is working in my application. There's, there's an infinite number of hypotheses to test. I mean, my, my startup, uh, right map, is, is all of you know, two or three months old. I, I could fill a, you know, a book with a number of hypotheses that I'd like to have answered about it, and if all I did was just try and gather the data that answers those hypotheses, the product would be exactly where it is, uh, right. you know, 10 years later. So how, how do you balance the trade-offs between gathering the data and actually building a product? I think Green's presentation discredits uh, the R uh, metrics from Dave McClure. <clears throat> Definitely Google that and look at that presentation. Uh, he kind of picks the uh, stats that are important. And as you said, like gathering data is really, really simple, but making sense of the data is what makes you the entrepreneur for Brightmap. So you have domain knowledge and you have experience. So looking at the data and like figuring things out so from what, that. What are the important things to, to look at? I mean, uh, there are like um, lots of different things like. Bon Retention, something. Yeah, activation, thank you. Activation, acquisition, retention, referral, and revenue. Um, and it breaks things down really, really easily. And you can then focus yourself on different parts of the funnel um, at different times. So there's, there's, they can learn some awesome presentations. Right. So for example, like how many visitors come to Brightmap and how many of them sign up? So you can look at the data can make changes and try to, you know. Right. So, so Brad, where, where does the R uh, formula fit into, you know, Union Square's, you know, uh, hypothesis, investment hypothesis, or, or process of, of, of looking at uh, investments? I think it fits very well with what we do because we do a lot of consumer-facing web services, but I, don't, I think it's going to be hard to apply to what you do um, because you've got, you know, you could have great engagement um, that wouldn't have a huge number of users, uh, but if you had, for instance, a very deep penetration in uh, in chemical processing or chem chemical distribution or something, and, and people really started to use that, you know, in in one niche, that would be really uh, telling for you. But if there were only 200 users, you know, the arg, the you know, activation number would be 200, and for us, that wouldn't be very. Uh, impressive. Okay. Um, well, uh, what about the, the some of the practical issues around um, lean? Uh, we were talking earlier about where the, where this funding is coming from. That it takes less money today to to fund. Uh, pros and cons of of uh, friends and family rounds, seed angel rounds. Um, what about doing consulting and people? People have all different sorts of ways to bootstrap. How do you know what, what's, what's the right one for you? I think it depends on who you are. I mean, if you can do consulting on the side, make money, that's great. But uh, one thing is, like, if you go to the previous uh, point, uh, if you have more than, if you are working with a co-founder, you definitely have to have a founder's agreement.
because eventually when you are looking for funding or when you do something else, investors are going to want to see everything is very clean and nicely laid out. So I, I think Peter can give us more information about this. Oh, you mean in, in terms of like of, incorporating? Of, 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 oh, yes. Funds. No, that's yeah. <clears throat> no, that's. I mean, in, in my in my experience, that it is very important that what investors are going to want to see is that when they're investing in a company, that there are, well, of, of course, the investors are going to give you the documentation that they want to see. So it almost doesn't matter what you have sitting there before the investors come in because they are they're going to have their own way of looking at the interrelationships that you that you have with your other with your co-founders and with any other investors that you might have already in place but i think it demonstrates a certain maturity and a certain sense of good practices if even though the vc or even the the angel networks now are going to come in and give you the set of documents that they want to see in terms of how what's going to protect their investments and how you're going to how the existing investors will relate to the new investors. I think it shows them uh, a level of maturity if you've already addressed a lot of those issues for yourselves. And it also, having, having gone through that once already, the existing investors and, and the existing founders will be more experienced in dealing with these issues when the investors come in and want to overlay uh, the kinds of documentation, the kinds of rights and privileges that they have. So I think it does, it, it's never too early to establish the relationships between founders, and that should be documented. Uh, are, there, are there certain corporate forms that are more investable than others or is, that you should avoid? Should you always be in Delaware? Should you always be a C Corp? Should you always be? In my, in my experience, you should always be in Delaware for a couple of reasons, and the main reason is that that's what most investors are familiar with. They like to see Delaware corporations or Delaware LLCs if you find an investor that's willing to invest in, in, an, in an LLC. Um, uh, Delaware just makes a lot of sense. You don't pay a lot, a lot of additional money to be in Delaware, and there are a lot of benefits from it. It's a very flexible statute. People know, people have a greater understanding of how that that state's laws function. Delaware is very responsive to your, to, to your needs as a management of a company. Um, they have a whole price list about how fast you want to get that answer. And you can pay different amounts of money based on the rapidity that, that you want to hear, hear back from them. So I, I always recommend Delaware. Delaware is obviously itself a very lean startup. <laughs> <laughs> yes. One, yes. one thing is uh, you can set up maybe like a New York State LLC, and then when you get funding, you can convert it, yes. but that's going to take extra money and but, you know, yes. it's probably possible. Yeah, I was just going to make one point on that because we're set up as an LLC, my current company. I know a lot of other startups or entrepreneurs have set their companies up as LLCs, maybe for the same reason because you do get the tax advantage at the beginning. What I was going to say is I would just advise that you structure it, even though it's an LLC, as though it were a corporation, just in case you do have to go down the VC route because VCs are going to probably make you convert. Into a corporation. What does that mean practically, st structuring as if it were a corporation? It just means just, uh, you know, LLCs, they, they can be uh, very amorphous. You could form it in a lot of different ways and, you know, different, like, if you were a law firm, you'd form it in a certain way. As a doctor, you could form an uh, office, you could form it in a certain way, partnership. But you can also structure it so that you have, like, units that behave like options, you know, things like that. Just try and think in terms of a corporation. And just tell your lawyer, or, or tell Peter, <laughs> to, to just make sure it's set up that way so that when you do convert, there's no headaches, basically. And okay. Peter gives free consulting, so <laughs> definitely yeah. talk to him. So there's, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think that um, there's a couple things to think about here. One is there is a reason why many venture capitalists, ourselves included, cannot invest in an LLC, and that is that we have investors themselves who are allergic to interest income or any kind of flow through income and so an LLC just doesn't work so if we're going to be an investor in your company it will become a C corp just that's and and almost all institutional investors have that limitation yeah. um, so but to go back to this uh, you know the founder agreement thing I, I really agree with this this notion that if, if you have been working for a year with somebody else or three other people on a basic understanding of, of how, how it's actually going to shake out when it gets documented, that's a very scary thing. Um, because 
it, it, you will find out when you actually sit down to document and there's money at the table and somebody wants to make the investment that there was a misunderstanding about how it was going to get documented. And there's no reason for it because you can have it right up front and it's not, it's, it should in no way be uncomfortable. And if it is uncomfortable, you probably have the wrong partners um, to sit down and say, how, how do we plan to work this out? Um, there's one other thing that, that is often misunderstood. A lot of VCs ask for um, founder vesting when they come in. Um, and you know, lots of times founders don't think about asking that up front for themselves. But what happens, and it's really kind of wild, and, and you don't anticipate it, is that your, your founder, who is your college roommate, is your best friend, um, and who's been working, you know, really working hard on this thing, gets married. And his wife has got a residency in a different city, and he's got to leave, and he, you know, he can't put the same time or effort in, and all of a sudden, a third of the capitalization of the company is no longer working at the company. And when you go to recruit somebody that replaces him, maybe he was the tech person that was doing all the coding, you now have to recruit somebody with options. You have no options, uh, or you, you can't give them. So, but where and and. A founder who does leave should expect, okay, I, I get it, I, I'm no longer involved, I maybe want to keep something and you can work that all out. But there should, there, there, it doesn't, it's really not about VCs wanting to you know, chain people to their desks, it's about the relationship between founders to make sure that that holds up. Brad, you've been listening in on so many of my conversations with clients, it's just amazing. <laughs> no, it really is something that, that, that you have to worry about because as Brad said, when you have, you put together a founder team, Typically, one guy is, a, is, is the CTO, one guy might be more financially oriented, one guy is the vision guy, he's, he's the CEO, and there are these functions. It's, it's not, the people are involved in this group for a reason. Each one of you is, form, is taking a certain function, and when one of the legs of that stool falls out because someone leaves or for whatever reason, if, they, if that person can, can take all of their equity with them, that is going to create an incredible amount of dilution to the people that are remaining because you're at the stage in the development of your company in which cash is not the major way that you're going to compensate people for, for performing. You're going to have to give out an incredible amount of equity to this new person who's performing that function. And if you don't have, you don't have a way to get the equity back from the old guy, you're going to be diluted greatly. So it's very important to work out um, the mechanisms between the founders as to what happened if someone drops out. Okay. Uh, let's take a couple questions. And uh, anybody have a question for our esteemed panel here about lean startups? How about all the way to the back, Pierre? I'll, I'll repeat it. How, how do you sustain yourself while you're bootstrapping? Yeah, particularly, and particularly if you find the pivot and you know that you got the right type of idea, but you're not sure how to. Got any advice for that? Um, I do, um, and I actually was waiting for this opening because there have been a bunch of comments about you know consulting or uh, prepaid revenue and ways of of sustaining yourself um, while while you're bootstrapping. Um, the you know, all of those things are useful, uh, but they're all distractions. And, um, you know, if you think about New York in the 90s, I was investing here in the 90s, uh, there were a ton of companies who were basically providing services, mostly web services, uh, you know, website development for um, corporate media companies here in New York. And they all tried to <coughs> pivot from being a service provider to being a product company. Uh, and they all went out and tried to raise money and, and, and most of them failed. In fact, I don't know of any that tried to do that pivot that, that were significantly successful. Um, and it's because that service provider 
um, mentality ends up through your entire organization. And when you, you end up being a service provider, when your client who's paying you a lot of money calls and says, I want this thing in pink now, um, you all your engineers stop what they're doing and, and, and make it pink. And when, when you're doing that, to then try and become a product company, it's very, very difficult. Now, if you can maintain, as Finn was saying, your product vision and your discipline and take some projects on the side that are very closely aligned to what you're trying to do and not give up anything to the, the, the person that's paying for those services, whether it's uh, time or contractual commitments to dedicate resources or, um, or you know, when you get prepaid uh, revenue from somebody for a product, if, if, you're, if that product is something you want to ship anyway and not customize, there, there are lots of ways you can do it. But if you, if you really start as a service company and try and become a product company, that is a very difficult pivot. So think of it just as you are a product company and you're moonlighting on a couple of things just to, to keep bread on the table while you build this product and you sustain your vision. Isn't 37 Signals a good example of somebody that did that? You know, I was just going to bring that up. <laughs> because I, I think, uh, and Pivotal Labs as well. Um, but I think, uh, to, to Brad's point, they are doing something that is not that far away from their core business. I mean, they both develop products which they use themselves uh, to service their customers. You know, Pivotal, obviously Agile Development, 37 Signals, Project Management. But I think it might also be a little bit different if you're a web development shop. Because if you're, gonna, if you're a web development shop and you're doing that for clients, which both of those companies are, as well as SourcePad is, and that's why I know it's, it's, uh, I can feel that similarity, it's not that far off to develop your own products. Really, you're just your own customer in a way. As long as you can manage you know, the customer distractions well enough. Um, OK. Uh, let's take one more, maybe two more questions. OK, Todd, go ahead. Um, so for a lot of main corporations, um, I think Things like legal help, which um, I mean, my company right now is, is fortunate enough to have three months of free legal help, and it's been an absolute blessing. It's made everything so much easier, and it's allowed us to really focus on our product and the product market fit. That being said, in three months' time, we won't have that anymore. And for a lot of the other really lean startups here, the, the cost of legal advice is almost prohibitively expensive. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that balance, and if there are ways to sort of approach it as a lean startup. When there's a great advantage to having legal help, but it's... Well, there, there, are, there are a lot of things that, that we do with, with some clients, which is uh, we, we, we try to, to talk with them about what are the... At this stage of your development, what is an essential project? What do you really need? Not a question of what you want, but what do you really need? We're, we also are able to uh, provide different, different types of pricing for different types of of projects, the projects that you really need, and we can price that differently for you. Uh, we can also defer some billing for you, but we really, but we're a business too, and we can do that only to the extent that we we see an endpoint to it. You know, if we if we if we believe that this client, if if financing is what they need, and financing is one of the goals that they that they have at that point, if we see that there's a financing that we can visualize in a certain amount of time, we're able to, we're willing to make some adjustments for that client. Um, but, you know, but, but, we, but we do need to get paid too. So it's within the context of ultimately, you know, we want to, uh, we want to have a long-standing relationship with a client. It's not just about getting, you know, getting as much money as we can out of it. I mean, if you approach clients I want to get as much money out of that out of that client as fast as I can. You're not going to have a lot of clients. It's a it's a big world, but it's a small world, and your reputation follows you wherever you 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 go. So, our approach is to try to really do right by our clients and try to be the right fit for our clients. If we don't see that we can be that right fit, meaning if it is really not the visibility to the financing that they need to be able to 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 pay us for the services that we have provided on a deferred billing basis or even be able to pay the reduced billing rate that we're, that we're offering for that period of time, then we'll be very upfront and there are lots of other attorneys that, that, that we respect that we can make a referral to and then with the understanding, or not the understanding, but with the hope that at this point in time in your development, this other arrangement 
is the best for you, and hopefully when your company matures and your company is in need of the kinds of legal services that a firm like, like ours can provide, that you'll, that you'll come back. Um, but if it's all about doing what's right for the, for the client without bankrupting your, yourself in the process. Yeah, if I could just speak from the other side of the table on that from Peter, because I'm the entrepreneur. Um, I think probably what you did and what I've done many times is, and Peter alluded to this, that he does this as well, I've gotten referred, deferred revenue, uh, sorry, deferred payment deals, um, gotten people to do things for equity. And, you know, I'm one uh, CEO, but I know a lot of other CEOs, and I think I've done that. A lot of other CEOs I know have done even more than that. Like, I've never gotten free rent. But I know other CEOs who have, you know, and, and I, I'm not quite sure how they did that, but they must have found, you know, that, that, that uh, really visionary landlord, I guess, you know. <laughs> so they must be out there. And, and I've gotten all these other things, too. You know, I, I know some people who've done incredible things. Um, but certainly, you know, folks like uh, Peter who are, you know, uh, very sophisticated, you know, probably uh, would be the people that you might want to talk to, uh, as well as other service providers that you can talk to in that vein. Okay, uh, let's take one more question. I think there's one right in the back right there. Hi, how are you? My question is about uh, early stage uh, evaluation. I'm developing uh, a web application now. Uh, I'm pretty confident that I can, with my founder, co-founder, uh, develop it without raising any money um, to a launch. My question is though, I have a friend, for example, who had offered to give me $100,000 know, to use so my question is, equity-wise, you know, I don't, I have no idea because I really don't know how to value my company. Sounds like a convertible note, right? Yeah. So. Is that the answer? That's the answer. Okay. <laughs> convertible notes is the answer to that question. For, for those of you who didn't uh, hear the question, it's, it's very early stage. I want some friends and family money. Uh, we don't know how to value the company. We don't know how much equity to give them for their hundred grand. Uh, there's, a, there's an easy solution to that, and that is you don't have to actually answer the question how much equity you get for 100 grand right now. Uh, you structure a convertible note, and such that at the Series A or some future financing round when some professionals are involved and they know exactly how much you're worth, uh, basically that 100,000 gets converted into that much equity plus a discount for being earlier on. Um, I don't know, does that do a good job explaining that? Perfect. That's how it works. Okay. So thanks very much for the panel, and uh, we'll see you all at Heartland in a few minutes.